Assalamu alaikum again. As we mentioned last week, we took three his, three stories from the life history of Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam, and we had some elaboration on them, uh, especially what we can derive from them from those stories. And there are many benefits one can derive, and you can look at so many different angles with, at, at, each, at each story really. But uh, we would just try to continue in the same theme. A few more stories today and what we can you know, glean from those in order to improve our situation here and help others out as well. Jazakallah khair. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Excuse me. Inna alhamdulillah na'hamaduhu wa nasdainuhu wa nasdaghfiru wa na'udhu billahi min shururi anfusina wa min sayyi'ati amalina man yahdihi allahu fala mudilla la wa man yudlil fala hadiya la wa ashadu an la ilaha illa allahu wahdahu la sharika la wa ashadu anna muhammadan abduhu wa rasuluhu amma ba'd assalamu alaykum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuhu we'll start with that story which uh, uh, some of you have already heard it's, uh, in Sahih Muslim actually and the Prophet ﷺ comes into the masjid and he sees people sitting by themselves, one, one sitting over there, one sitting over there, one or two sitting here, one or two groups sitting here. And he says, Why do I see you sitting separately? Why are you separated? The Prophet ﷺ didn't like an unnecessary display of outward disunity uh, because it could affect inward disunity on the long run. And so adab al-majlis is that we come uh, closer uh, together in all cases, inshallah ta'ala, as, as, as much as possible. And actually that uh, really sums up what we started last week. The seerah, the biography of the Prophet sallallahu even though we're just looking at snippets and slots to see how that could apply to us living here as a, a Muslim minority, Muslim minorities in the West, it's very much about adab, and you can't get away from that in Islam, adab. As the Prophet ﷺ said, I have only been sent to perfect noble manners, noble character. And the root of that character <coughs> is exemplified in the Prophet ﷺ in that he is sent as a mercy to the world. We didn't send you except as a mercy to the world. And the whole seerah tells us about how we begin in our day-to-day -day lives, moving from our nafs to our ruh, or if we were to use this same word nafs, moving from our nafsul ammara, and nafsul ammara than bisu, our soul that constantly incites towards evil, to the nafsul mutma'inna, the tranquil soul, which is pleased with its Lord and its Lord pleased with it. So whether we're talking about the nafs to the ruh, Okay, from ugliness to beauty, or from nafsul ammar to nafsul mutma'inna, it's the same kind of concept. Okay, nafsul shay, it's the one and the same thing. And what the seerah shows from one angle, if one studies it from a point of view of not being a Muslim, it looks like a, a, a human being with some extraordinary qualities, doing some extraordinary things in this world, that it's not that they haven't been done before, but they haven't been done with such brilliance and with, uh, with, such, uh, uh, with such beauty as before. And the danger of that, uh, which is the danger of, say, uh, anthropologists and non-Muslim historians, and those Muslims who, uh, they have a, a desire for, uh, for Islam, a, a, a hamas, an emotion, but they don't have much religious knowledge. And so when they look at the seerah of the Prophet ﷺ, they don't actually see the, uh, what's behind the surface. They just see the surface, the table. Okay? They don't see what's actually underneath the, uh, beneath the surface. Just like the people of dunya. When, the, when people of dunya or when people who have very weak iman and religious knowledge look at the world, 
uh, they could look at the world and it's like it's a big mess. There's deep suffering in the midst of, uh, well, we're not in economic brilliance, but let's just say uh, go back four or five years when the bubble hadn't quite burst. It seemed like an economic brilliance. And yet, even at that time, whatever European, or Western European country you were living in, or, or United States, even if there was economic brilliance and prosperity here, but two-thirds or, or more than three-quarters of the world were living below the poverty line, and billions, uh, millions and millions of people were starving and dying of starvation. The world was in a mess then, but actually... When the believer looks at the world, he sees some really tragic things that he knows that he has to put right. Or he has to be part of the program, strategy, healing of putting right. It's part of uh, enjoining good and forbidden evil. Enjoining the, what, is, what is good and forbidding what is wrong. It's part of establishing justice. It's part of ihsan, this excellence uh, that we have to share and reach out to with others. But when the believer looks at the world, he knows firstly the world unfolds exactly according to the divine plan. And at no stage, and at no stage of the world, is the world devoid of mercy. And Ibn al Qayyim, rahmatullah uh, alayhi, in one of his books, he spends a lot of time explaining how suffering, hardships, and calamity, even the creation of Iblis, the devil himself, okay, because the, 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 the atheistic mind could ask, uh, well, you know, why create Iblis? Why couldn't just God create a happy, perfect world? Okay, and the answer is, well, he could have. But that wouldn't have actually fulfilled the deeper wisdom of what he wanted with this world and with particularly human beings. And so even in the presence of even with, with the devil, evil personified, that in itself from one angle, because the coin has two sides. On one side, the devil, it's, all, it's bad. He's bad. But on the flip side, there is a type of mercy and there is a type of khayr, uh, goodness, in his presence. How? Well... That we know the devil, we know, uh, uh, and we begin to understand what he is about and his strategies, clearly defines us, defines for us evil, evil qualities, evil acts, evil intentions. And that gives us a better understanding of what is good. As the Arabs say, as the Muslim scholars say, by their opposites are things best clarified. So that's a mercy. Another uh, a thing of mercy is that there is this thing that, well, the devil equals hellfire, and then what happens, there is a, a greater yearning not to be like that, and a greater commitment to God. That in itself is a mercy. It may be, it may be a bit of a stick, to, you know, like a, it's a threat to keep away from, but it's a mercy nonetheless. What I'm trying to say is, the seerah teaches us, not just how to deal with particular situations, social, political, family, mashallah, that's absolutely there. But the, the undercurrent of the seerah is expressing itself in mercy, beauty, truth, godliness, ihsan, spiritual excellence. And it's all there to remind us that this is the way in which we can make the remembrance of Allah a concrete reality in our lives. Because every act of worship has as its goal, as Imam Ibn Taymiyyah rahmatullah alayhi says in more than one of his fatawas and treaties, has at its goal the remembrance of Allah or the consciousness of Allah. Allah bi dhikri la, uh, sorry, wa aqimu salat li dhikri. Establish prayer for my remembrance. And so the examples that we looked at last week, very quickly, we looked at, um, not necessarily in order, we looked at the fact that uh, the Prophet ﷺ went to Thaif hoping for some good reception because the people in Makkah weren't responding to his message well and ultimately he was chased out, uh, bad reception. Um, angel of uh, the mountains came, said, I can crush the, this Thaif village, if, uh, town if you want between the two mountains in the valley. He said, don't do that. 
For I hope from amongst their offsprings, their progeny will come a people who will worship Allah alone, not associating partners with him. So there is the act of Rahmah. Prophet is deeply hurt. He's hurt from two levels. He's hurt because, first and foremost, Allah's message has been just unduly rejected. They haven't even given him a chance to speak it yet. And they're just rejecting it in favor of just pure jahili, tribalistic idolatry. And that's a hurt for the one who has a passion for, uh, for Tawheed. And then the second thing is there is a physical hurt. Okay, and they, I mean, they're accusing him of lying and all sorts of things, and then they're physically abusing him. And so there's a level of hurt. And though his anger is for the sake of Allah, his anger doesn't boil over into rage. I'm just going, boof. Okay, and he could have been anger for the, angry for the sake of Allah and asked for the destruction of the people. Okay, but he saw some doesn't. It neither boils over into rage, which is just not Islamic at all, and secondly, it, he, he, mercy dominates the quality of anger or divine retribution, which would have been perfectly according to the teachings of uh, Allah, because previous prophets had that choice and some of them opted for Allah, you know, it's, I, we feel it's about time, you know, with your permission to punish these people. And people did get punished. Eventually, communities and, and nations were destroyed. But the process doesn't do that. And so the lesson there is uh, we come to a people who, in their obstinate idios uh, idioticness, they don't want to listen to the message. Or they've had bad uh, propaganda about it. Or they're just not ready to leave their, their, their gods in the form of idols, <coughs> and materialistic idols in this case, not kind of idols that you have maybe in many parts of India. Um, and the prophetic way is to be patient and hope that something of faith will come from amongst those people rather than divine retribution. That was the first lesson we learned. The other lesson we, we said that there, there came a time when, when Uthbeg ibn Rabi'a uh, on behalf of Quraysh says, you know, we can offer you, you know, the, the prettiest women, uh, all of the money, political authority, or if, if it be that you're possessed by jinns, we'll get the best doctors and spend every penny that we have in curing you. And just accept all of them or any one of them, you know, just so that we can call a truce. And he rejects all of that. So it tells us that... Uh, uh, you know, and I think my difficulty, my, my fault is... Okay, and not, not the only fault I have, but... Uh, is sometimes I... When I speak to a, a lot of audience, not every audience... I give them the benefit of doubt that there is some intellectual maturity. It doesn't matter whether you've been to university or not, that's irrelevant. Okay, because going to university doesn't necessarily make you intellectual or not. Okay. But, some, but, uh, but I think a number of Muslims keep proving me wrong. Right? <laughs> Telling me something else. Because we need to think in nuances, in shades of grey, not just in black and white. So when I say based on that hadith, and I, we, I won't go into it again because we spent quite a while on it, that actually political authority wasn't the, the mainstay of the religion. I mean, it's, the Prophet knows, I mean, it doesn't re require a clever person to know. If I get political authority, there is a good chance that I can spread my message easier and better. But he doesn't do that because political authority, it required some type of compromise. Okay, But here it's about rolling up your sleeves, struggling for the sake of Allah, just as it was from the most ancient of days, that when truth comes, uh, 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 comes into contact or uh, head on with falsehood, there's going to be a struggle. We don't want to make it, and this is, I'm using this as an, an adjective, not as a swear, swear word, we don't want to make it a bloody struggle necessarily, but um, sometimes that can't be avoided. Okay? Uh, but tr when truth and falsehood, they just don't, they're just not good bedfellows. And nor are we allowed to make them get nikah together. Because right? okay, they're just not compatible. And the, the kafa is just not there. And so the, pro, the Prophet ﷺ says no. And that just reminds us that actually those who make politics and political sovereignty the goal. And they're ready to kind of, you know, we won't speak too much about Tawheed. And we won't speak too much about this. And we, they've misunderstood the whole of the seerah. And this is just a modern phenomenon. 
uh, which really is only a mimicking, not of the theatre, of uh, late uh, uh, um, mid 19th century Western political philosophies. Okay? Really, that's what it is, especially those political philosophies which involve people of different, people of faiths like Christianity or Judaism. Okay? It's very much, but not the same thing, but it's very much in, in the spirit, in the, uh, in the imitation of political Judaism, which, is, which we call Zionism. Okay? People have to understand, but that is not saying at all that Siyasa has no place in Islam. Absolutely not. It's just showing you that every step of the way in the seerah, and this is not one proof or two proof, if we had the whole day, you know, if we could laboriously go through a whole day, there probably would be about 500 or 800 proofs how Tawheed, or Tawheed in the sense of not just believing God is one, that singling him out for worship trumps just any and everything. Okay? And so we, we learned that. And then the, th the third thing we learned was that the third story was, yeah, was the, Jew, the Jewish thing, yeah, uh, Alayset Nafsan, isn't he, isn't he a human soul? That though Islam looks at Judaism as once upon a time it was, uh, it was a, a, a version of, the, the, uh, of Islam, it, it was an disp Islamic dispensation, God revealed to Moses on Mount Sinai. Okay, um, be, uh, and he revealed to Noah something before, and he revealed to David and Abraham, peace be upon them all. Versions of Islam, dispensations of Islam, they were all Muslims submitting to God. Okay, um, and that's how we see the Muslims probably, you know, they're, they're, they're Muslim is not the Muslim with the like kind of capital M, like Muslim as in submitting Muslims, not with the same kind of Sharia as we have. Um, but over the course of history, uh, Judaism, or the original teachings of Musa Alayhi Salam, changed, got forgotten, got drowned out by dunya and compromises, got intentionally changed by some of the uh, religious scholars who sold their religion for a meagre price, and various other things such that today, and for a long, long time, Judaism uh, now doesn't represent the true version of Islam. And then the teachings of Jesus went through the same uh, the, the, the same uh, problem, such that today it doesn't re uh, represent the true teachings of Tawheed, and only the Islam that the Prophet Sallallahu came with does. Nevertheless, and so even though the Quran tells us how they have changed the words from their proper place and corrupted scripture and kind of, so many things, it still doesn't actually give us an overall philosophy of just completely hating. <coughs> and rejecting and not considering of any worth or value the, the kind of Judaic history of the, of the history of those who uh, follow Christ. That is to say, in the Jewish context, that it really wasn't a problem with Judaism. When Muslims generally, when, Mus when Jews lived under Muslim law as Dhimmis, and I don't want to call Dhimmis second-class citizens or first-class citizens, but they didn't have the same status as Muslims because uh, the nature of pre-modern societies and the nature of, uh, of belief is that if there is truth, truth must always be greater than falsehood. It can't be put on the same level pegging. Okay? And a Muslim should never feel... Muslim, as a Muslim, I must feel very humble and have humility, and I'm not allowed to have arrogance or pride and feel I'm better than. But as a theory, as a concept, we have this clear belief, any Muslim is better than every Kafir. Now, when it applies to me specifically, a specific Muslim, of course I believe that in terms of Iman, but I might not think so in terms of honesty, truthfulness, and charity, and, and, and. I have to have a sense of realism about myself and humility. But no Muslim, the believer is not equal to the unbeliever. The one who is a knower of God and his Tawheed is not, equal to, is, is not the same as the one who has, does not have that knowledge. We must be absolutely clear on this. There is no, we don't believe in spiritual equality of kufr, Iman and disbelief? Absolutely not. Okay? And we need to be very careful of soaking in the dominant ideologies that were kind of born into the time. So the, the, that, that lesson, all it told us, the third and final one, was that our problem with much of the Jewish people as a people begins to start uh, properly, you know, 1917, 1918, 1945, with uh, 
1945, 46, 48, with the, the creation of, of Israel and political Zionism having its, uh, its roots firmly. Okay. Otherwise, Alaysat Nafsan, isn't he a human soul? Otherwise, the Prophet married, uh, married a, a, a Jewess and she became from the Ummahatul um, Mu'mineen. Otherwise, uh, throughout history, uh, the, Jew, the Jewish communities have had more flourishment under Muslim rule, Muslim Spain and Muslim Ayyubi, Salahuddin Ayyubi kind of rule, than they've had any time in, in, uh, in, in, in the history of, of Europe. Uh, and so our problem isn't with the Jews. Now it has become an issue about Palestine and what is now being referred to as, which is now referred to as the state of Israel. And that needs to be very clear. How you express those things is very difficult. But nevertheless, I, because what happens is, uh, when I was growing up, just you know, it was like whenever something kicked off in that Israel Palestine thing, you'd get groups of Muslims going down. Uh, What's the place there in... High Street Kensington. Sorry? High Street Kensington. Uh, not High Street Kensington. Uh, keep going outside onto the areas. On Hyde Park. Park. Not Hyde Park. <laughs> uh, we're talking about with Jewish communities. Golders Green. Golders Green. And also, and also Stamford Hill. Okay. Place like that. And the first, you know, the first uh, Jew that they saw with, yeah, with, with curly lock or whatever... Uh, SubhanAllah, and it's like, well, well, I've done something really great. Really, do you think Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala ignores injustice from Muslims? He will take non-Muslims to task for any small just, uh, act of injustice, but Muslims are somehow exempted. No, that's the same tribalism that al-Yahud eventually got themselves into. Okay. However, uh, we are now left with a, a very acute problem of political Zionism, uh, Israel, Palestine, and the conflict that continues uh, even now. Two more uh, examples I'd like to give uh, in what we could learn. The first one is the story of Fudayk. There comes a time, round about the time of the Hijrah of the Prophet Sallallahu that he, he feels that all the Muslims, if they haven't gone to Abyssinia already, uh, they need to make the migration to Med Medina, because that's the only way Muslims are going to be secure. Because it's the nature of a lot of people. Once they don't recognize what you're about, or they can't, or you're not, you don't fit into the same stream of thinking or living as they do, there could be a lot of hostility. Europe is known for that. Okay? One of the reasons, one of the philosophies behind the, uh, the original European Union is that they understood that leave Europe to itself and its own devices. France and Belgium and Italy and, and, and Great Britain and very, whatever, the Scandinavian countries, most of them will go to very nasty war between themselves. So human beings have learned from ages and ages ago, thousands and thousands of years ago, one of the ways to alleviate tension is to start having economic relationships between people. When the economic relationships, trading between people becomes really strong, you're less likely to go to war and break that economic uh, bounty that both sides are sharing from. And that, based upon that, uh, and even in periods of intense political hostility between the, what was the Christian world and was what was called the, the Dar Islam, the Muslim world, you'll find when political relationships broke down, trade always continued. Just read history, okay? Find the worst times, political times, between Darul Islam and the Christian world, okay? Uh, we're talking about Crusade One, Second Crusade, so, and you look at the trade going on, and it's all still going on like nothing's happening, okay? Because just trade is just trade, okay? So, the um, Fudayk is a, a Muslim who he like many other Muslims, are living amongst non-Muslims, um, a mushrikul. And most mushriks, most, uh, sorry, most Muslims have left their towns and their little tribal areas and moved over to Medina, because Medina is where safety is for the Muslims. Okay, it's the cradle of safety for the Muslims. There is Amun. And everywhere else in the peninsula, there's khawf, there's fear for Muslims. And so, and the Prophet gives this general thing of hijrah, migrate, make the exodus. And Fudayk, he's kind of ready to pack his bags too. 
And his townsmen, who are non-Muslims, who are mushrikun, idolaters, they say, where are you going? I'm going to make the hijrah. But we don't want you to leave. He goes, I don't want to leave as well. Uh, because we're not oppressing you. you know, though we're not of your religion, we have kind of no problem with your religion. He goes, yeah, I agree. I'm, I'm kind of pretty cool here. And he goes to the process and with this kind of, uh, with this conundrum that actually, you know, I, I'm actually not being victimized at all. Uh, my, and I'm allowed to practice my religion freely. Uh, so do I really have to make the migration? And the Prophet says to him, Ya Fudayk, aqimu salat wa atu zakah wa ahjuru su wa skun ma'a qawmik haythu ma shit takun muhajir. O Fudayk, establish the prayer and pay the zakat and keep away from wrongdoing and falsehood. And live with your people wherever you wish. You'll be counted as one who made hijrah, who migrated to me. You'll get the same reward. Waskun ma'akomik. Live with my people. A question was asked on Wednesday in the Valentine's Mansion Circle. Uh, it was put as a more of a claim, but it was a question claim. And part of the claim, the, the brother, Jazan al khairan to him, he said that, oh, but isn't this being broken up into countries and states and nations? Isn't this all a, a bid'ah? It contributes to our disunity and it's a bid'ah. We never had these different countries and breaking up into, into nations and states and countries in the time of the Prophet And it's causing and look at the disunity. And there's no doubt that the disunity factor is absolutely true. Okay, and let, you know, I'm not talking about the world, it's just about the Muslims. The Muslims being broken up. Absolutely. But it's not true that we never had the ideas of countries and regions and states. I mean, how did you know that you were from Makkah? You're, you know, you're Abdullah al makki Well, what did that tell you? You weren't from Timbuktu, you're from Makkah. Abdullah al-Madani, Suhail al-Rumi, Bilal al-Habashi, Habash, Abyssinia, Rum, Roman, from the Byzantine regions, Salman al-Farsi, the Persian. He comes from that region, from that stock of people. The Prophet didn't say, oh, stop calling people these, uh, these titles because it's all bid'ah, it splits us. No. Allah, the Qur'an is clear in Surah Al-Hijrat that he created, he created you into tribes and nations that you may know each other. The problem isn't having tribes and nations and qabail and countries. The problem is, is when we're ready to uh, uh, make or break Muslim unity and uh, uh, allegiance based upon just those countries. Make them demagogues. Yeah, in that sense, make it a, a political demagogue. Absolutely. Otherwise, just having countries, that's not a problem. And that... Um, and this comes really because I was actually brought up on this uh, in the 80s. Oh, we don't have countries, we shouldn't have borders. But these are not Sharia things as they are just worldly things and if they're useful, good, and if they don't break the spirit or the letter of the law, fine, and if they're not, they're not. Can you imagine not having any borders in any country today in a world which has 7 billion people in it, in which most of the world is poor and you have some, only a few pockets of economic prosperity? Just imagine if like another two billion people decided to flood into um, southern India, Bangalore, because it's an up and coming economic powerhouse. Two, two billion, even another 2,000, it probably wouldn't cope. It, it just run riot and have no, no, no borders. No, there, there are reasons that the world develops as they are. We just have to look be, beneath the surface and not say, oh, it wasn't in the time of the process. In the time of the process, he never encouraged anyone to speak English. And the only people he might have spoke, told, encouraged to speak a foreign language is someone who is entrenched in their faith and their religion to go and give dawah. But here we are. And most of us can't even speak the, the language of revelation. But we've not thought of, that doesn't become a bid'ah. In fact, that is more of a problem for Muslim faith than countries and whatever, and Kabail and groups. But that's not the way that the ulama look at it. So for them, <coughs> he's told this. So what's the lesson we can learn? Well, first and foremost, we can learn that a type of, and I'm going to use the word not in its uh, negative sense, just in its descriptive sense, that being part of a nation of people Okay, it's not against Islam. It's neither something for Islam or against Islam. It's just one of those things which are mubah, permissible. And that the world has always 
most of the time or always worked like that. So being a British Muslim, or a Pakistani Muslim, or a Spanish Muslim, or a Nigerian Muslim, or a, or a Saudi Arabian Muslim, or, it's not a huge problem. There may be some issues about it, but it's overall not a problem. And neither is it a problem to say that, as a British Muslim, these are my people, the Brits, the atheists of them, the Christians of them, the Jews of them, the Sikhs of them, the Hindus of them, and all the other shades of colour that we have here. As long as we're clear that we also have that, that's just origin of birth or citizenship, but we have something higher than that of faith, which is the global Muslim community. They are my people in a deeper sense. Innam al mu'minun ikhwa. The believers are but brothers. Okay, so uh, a, a Muslim over there on the farthest corner of the earth. He or she is my brother, they're my brothers. We are bonded by faith. And inshallah ta'ala, that's even more important. But here I am, uh, second generation Muslim, born here in the 60s, know nothing but this country, been back to my parents' country a few times, southern India, but it's not really home, it's holiday. Okay. And, ya fudaik. Live with your people. The Prophet is telling that these mushriks that were already our the Quran comes to wipe away their false deen, and they're actually your people, not because of their belief or whatever, it's just because because you live with them. <coughs> just like the Hud salam and Salih alayhi salam, they come to their people. Ya qawm ibudullah, oh my people. Because once you if a person doesn't have a sense of belonging. And someone can say, I can belong to the Ummah. That's true in a spiritual, very religious sense. But in a very concrete sense, if you don't feel like belonging, you're not going to be very much use to people. Okay. You won't have that concern and commitment for what's on your doorstep. It will be a shallow concern. It will be, in fact, it won't even be a concern. It will just be a political tool. Okay, socialists... You know, and, uh, and Marxists, you, 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 you find it so, some, of them, some of them were committed to the cause, but some of them were just like, subhanAllah, just use the ideology as a political tool. You have no concern for the poor, okay, because you're not living like the poor. Okay. So, we need to be very clear on this. And it's true that some of these things have been rethought out or kind of re emphasized after 9 11. There's no denying that. Why wasn't this emphasized before 9-11? Not because there was an absence of this understanding in our texts. It's just that uh, once human beings, and including Muslims, once you're following a particular way of thinking and you know, your world view, uh, you think, oh, okay, that's the way we should have. I mean, if you, you know, I mean, go back into Muslim history. When Ibn Khaldun, okay, when Ibn Khaldun is writing his Muqaddama, and he's speaking about the world from this philosophical, historical process, okay? And we're, at the, we're almost at the height of our, our greatness as a, as a Muslim empire or empires. He describes all the different parts of the world. He describes China, he describes Hind and their history, and he describes uh, much of North uh, and West Africa and their greatness and their civilization and this, and the Romans and the Greeks and the Persians and this. And then he says, and yeah, you know that kind of... He doesn't use the word Europe, but kind of that Western Europe. It's a backwards place and nothing really great has come out of it. And he literally says, so we can kind of skip over it. But Ibn Khaldun writes in the 14th century. It is that same century that in Italy, okay, and the surrounding area, Europe are going through their renaissance, their rebirth. They're rediscovering something of science, philosophy and civilization. Okay. But yet we dismissed it. Generally, it's what we call civilizational arrogance. Kind of, we're, you know, we know we're the boss. And that, like, what has come out of that little corner of the world? Nothing. So we don't need to pay attention to it. And look how Allah does. Not only does Allah, you know, give it some kind of attention, okay? It then becomes that little corner of the world and the, the island Britain, which is even a tiny corner of that same world, then is able to kind of trump. In, in you know in the lot in, in within three four hundred years after that particular time so much of the world and we're all influenced and affected by it by one way or the other. Uh, likewise, when Shah Walilah two three hundred three hundred years writing in Muslim India, 
okay, in, in Mughal India. Uh, the Brits are there, okay. Uh, uh, they're not there as in the they're not there in the British Raj because uh, the, uh, the political establishment of of Britain don't give the East Indian Company the full back the backing yet. But the East Indian Company as a the, it's the it's the multinational corporation of its time. They come into the country in their trading and with their arms and whatever, whatever, and very soon they more or less take it over. But Shah Walila has hardly anything to say, Rahmatullah about the changes taking place within Western Europe. Read any of his writings. It's hardly there. Why? Because it's, it's it's not him per se. It's not his fault per se. There's just an understanding. It's, it's just kind of like just a hiccup in history. It's just, it's just a little blip. It's not gonna not gonna last, unbeknown to us. That you know, no one's gonna be shaking these people off of their backs too soon. So what I'm trying to say is, uh, these things, our idea of oh we can. There is something in our book, the book and the Sunnah, that tells us that we can have a level of national belonging without being nationalistic. And that they can be our people, even though they're non-Muslims. The reason why they weren't emphasised is because many Muslims and Muslim scholars still had a particular way of looking at the world, which was a little bit out of step with the reality. Now, that's not dissing their scholarship. It's just showing that sometimes the rot can set in. And it takes events or a trigger to, to, to start making things happen. Okay? And what do they say? Um... Necessity is the mother of inventions. When you have a need, you start thinking uh, uh, novel ways of a solution. And war, quite often, brings about great inventions, ways of thinking and being, and, and, and. Which is why Ibn al-Qayyim in the Zad al-Ma'ad, which is really his, his biography of the Prophet but it's juristic, it's, it's fiqhi, it's theological, it's social, it's spiritual, okay? And it doesn't read like a, a seerah, but it is a seerah. The most benefit, beneficial points that he gives to us are when he's describing the various battles of the Prophet ﷺ. Because in the battles, there are just so many fawaid and points. It's just unbelievable. And the Zad al-Ma'ad is just known for having the great uh, fiqhi teachings when he's describing the, the great Maghazi battles and ghazwas of the Prophet ﷺ. I mean, when I say battles, I mean, we shouldn't think of battles like the Battle of Trafalgar, or, because really, first and foremost, in, in the whole of, the, of, of all of the, the 24, 25 battles of the process, and no more than, what, like 300 Muslims and non-Muslims died. And not more than that. Um, sometimes an army would consist of about 80 people. Sometimes, you know, n big numbers are like, Except big exception numbers are like 3,000 and 5,000, but normally they're like 100, 200, 70, like that. Okay, so we would call some of those skirmishes. Okay, so this has to be woven in uh, so that we can because there is still a lot of talk, isn't there? Oh, you know, them, 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 meaning the non Muslims, there's us and then there's them, and there is in one real sense, Iman and Kufr. <coughs> But them, them, them is, it's also said by many young Muslim uh, youths in a way that we don't belong and there's no way we can uh, belong. And, you know, here I am, I've, my, my parents are from Pakistan, okay, or even India, right, okay, and I've got no connection with them, okay, I'm a third generation Muslim, but I'm still going to support Pakistan or Indian cricket, this, because why, just religiously, I'm not allowed to support England. I mean, there's probably no reason to support English non-religiously, especially in football, because it's not coming home for a long time, probably. But I, what I'm saying is, it's the religiousness. I feel that I can't. Okay? Uh, that kind of thing has a very... You, you may think it's very superficial, but actually, when you have loads of youths who feel that we don't belong, we can never belong religiously. This is just not permissible by theory. Uh, that's going to cause a huge social problem and uh, 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 and a uh, misrepresentation, uh, not misrepresentation, a misreading of Islam, brother Elias. Just while you're saying that, just clarify one point. You know, before our fathers and stuff, they used to think that they're here temporarily for economic reasons, they have to go back. Mm -hmm. But the new thought is, especially amongst the youth who are religious, is that they have to do hijrah. Mm -hmm. Islamically, they're not supposed to be here. Mm -hmm. So it's not just... Uh, 
So this causes a disconnection. Yeah, the that's a good point. In the society. You're, that's a very good point. Our brother Elias is saying, okay, uh, we've got kind of the opposite end. Uh, many of uh, many of the first generation of Muslims thought uh, we have to. Uh, we came here economically. We'll be here for a year or two, but eventually we'll go home. Uh, but most of them didn't go home. This became their home. Uh, but now we have a newer phenomenon, which is uh, m uh, mainly a religious brother or sister. Once they get religious, they feel there is an obligation to do hijrah, that is to migrate from the non-Muslim lands to the, non uh, for, to the Muslim lands uh, for the sake of religion, not economic uh, reason. And then what happens is, uh, and it's my experience too, that it happens more than it doesn't happen, is that then you get people who, who say these things for the next 10 years and they don't contribute a single benefit to society. If I didn't see that once, twice, three times, over 100 times in my life, in my lifetime, in 25 years, I wouldn't mention it. But it does. It becomes a devil's excuse. However, let's break it down. Break it down into a, 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 a Sharia issue. What is a Sharia ruling of Muslims abiding amongst the non-Muslims by choice. Muslim minorities living amongst uh, uh, non-Muslim minorities by choice. Then the Islamic ruling is either it is not permissible because, Islam, the, is, because some jurists in their deep understanding of Islam could not countenance Muslims being able to live and practice their faith freely without their uh, religious beliefs being eroded, or if not their religious beliefs, their religious morality, which is also an obligation to keep intact. And if not them themselves, then their children's beliefs or morality. And so they said, due to that reason, and there are many texts to justify it, the, there should never be the, the fire of the kafir and the fire of the Muslim in close proximity. And fire means the cooking fire. And you cook when you're settled. Okay. Um... Uh, and the one who lives, the Prophet said in the authentic hadith, the one who lives amongst the Muslims and whatever trouble comes him, and min hum, that I'm free of them. Halas, whatever troubles they bring upon themselves, I've got nothing to do with it. Don't come running to us for a solution. And I remember back in uh, 80, I think 87 or 88, uh, there was an issue of, uh, because we were told we couldn't, we were told that we couldn't access the police force because it's non-Muslim governance, let alone um, jury and all this, and it's all non-Muslim. So we asked this um, scholar in, in, uh, in uh, he was from Riyadh, but we actually found him in Makkah, in, in, in Umrah. And uh, he, we put to him this thing that one of the brothers has been ar arrested and he's been tried with something very big, and we kind of now need some lawyers and this, that, and the other, and whatever, so are we allowed to use non-Muslim lawyers and this, that, and the other one? And we were just kind of a new bunch of kind of 19, 18, 19-year-old youths or 20-year-old youths. And the, the sheikh said, he goes, A'udh billah. He goes, I'm free of that. If you've, you've chosen to live in that, in that rat hole, then you need to dig your way out. And off he went and he kind of made some more tawaf or whatever else. He kind of just, you know, there's like, there's like the roadrunner. You know, like that and all you left is with some smoke. <laughs> he was kind of looking and he went. Anyway, point being is, so those scholars who say hijra is wajib from a non-Muslim country to a Muslim country, we need to kind of just respect that opinion. It is a minority view, and actually more and more contemporary scholars not only don't take that view, first and foremost, it's been a minority view. Okay? Secondly, even now, uh, even many of those people who took the minority view just don't see it as a practical reality at all. And Islamic jurisprudence is also tied up with practicalities. It's also tied up with what, what the reality is on the ground. It's not just pie in the sky. Uh, that, so we need to respect that. The dominant opinion is it is permissible to reside amongst the non-Muslims providing your faith and your basic morals can be intact. Your, and when they say faith, they say that the, uh, the sha'ar the, the sha of Islam, the, the, the symbols of Islam can be practiced. Eid celebrations, Friday celebrations, uh, the, the daily prayers, the sacrificing, um, the giving of zakat, the performing of hajj and, and fasting, really those, and the basic halal and haram, you can keep away from meat, uh, um, um, pig's meat and, and, uh, and wine and things like that. No. Um, and, that's, and they say that it's permissible, <coughs> though preferable to live amongst Muslim communities, but it's permissible to live amongst non-Muslim communities. They also count, didn't countenance the fact that how could, because I remember speaking to a sheikh in Medina, in early 90s, and I tell you, I must have given him one of his worst headaches. 
Because he said to me, Abu Alia, how do Muslims live in the UK? I said, well, can't we just live? He goes, are there many mosques? I said, well, if you go to the big cities, there are loads of mosques. He goes, like, uh, like what, very far apart? I said, no, sometimes you can have them within three or four minutes walk of each other, especially in the UK, less in the United States because Yashik Sheikh is a bigger country. So you know, Britain, very small, okay? And he said, what, very near each other? He goes, yeah, so, so where do the Muslims live? Do they live in one encampment and they are surrounded by the kuffar? I said, you mean like a, like a concentration camp? He goes, yes. I said, no, we just live, some of us live with lots of Muslims, some of us live with mostly uh, non-Muslims, some are mixed and whatever. He goes, you just live anywhere and everywhere. He goes, yeah. He goes, and, and the government doesn't mind. I said, no, you know, you buy your house or you rent your house legally, you know, it's not a problem. He said, they, let, they just let you live like that? And we're all, there's about 15, 20 of us in the room from America, from, you know, from the... And we're looking at the chef, we're thinking, what's, what's the problem here? Really, we, we, don't, we can't see the issue. And she, you could see... He just had come from South Africa, probably. Uh, no, yeah, yeah, well, actually, he's born and bred in, 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 in Medina, okay? And he just couldn't understand that, how could that be? Because historically, okay, you could be a, a Jew or a Christian and you can live in Muslim Baghdad in classical times, Okay. Uh, you could be a, forget about Ahlul Kitab, you could even be a Mushrik, a Zoroastrian, and you can live under Hanafi, Ottoman, Mughal rule, and still thrive at some level. But you could never be a Muslim and live in the great western city of Paris, or the emerging great city of London. No, there you just have to be a Christian. But within multicultural Baghdad, with Islam as the dominant thing, there were... There was a cosmopolitanness, and some rulers were more flexible on it than others. But by and large, there was a level of flexibility. Certainly, it's not like religious pluralism today. This is the modern world, and that was a pre-modern world. But as pre-modern world uh, freedoms, liberties, and or, or rather tolerance goes, even Bernard Shaw, a bastion of neoconservatism, and one of the great American historians, political historians, will tell you that actually the level of religious tolerance uh, instigated by classical Muslim societies was the best that you were ever going to get in the classical world compared to uh, Christian or, 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 or Europe or Japan or China or Persia or wherever. Okay. Um, so uh, the second bit is when you get people that my, my problem with this is too when you get uh, one or two scholars who are just they haven't got, they have forgotten responsibility, fatwa with responsibility. So they'll tell a young, boy, a young man or a young woman, yes, he generates this and wind him up to whatever, and that's it. Where he should go, and certainly not going to get to Saudi Arabia for a very long time. Right, okay. And then if you are, ya rafiq, ya rafiq, ya rafiq, and your, your rights and your religious practice go downhill, and that's not, my, that's not my anger speaking, that's just my experience speaking. The amount of times I visited the brothers in the Islamic University of, uh, 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 of Medina, or the amount of times that I met brothers in Riyadh, or that they came back to, you know, because their wife were pregnant, we don't want to go to a Saudi hospital, we want to go to Whip's Cross. Well, that's a great hijra you're doing, all right? Okay, every time you're coming back for hospital. Okay, um, and they said, subhanAllah, it's just, life is abysmal here. No, and the dawah that we were doing, on Saturdays and going down to Leicester Square and calling people to Islam, oh, there's nothing like that at all. Anyway, point being is, uh, scholars should be, uh, the few scholars that still like that should be careful. Scholars are, have the right, and we shouldn't deny them their right of their scholarly judgment. That's their god fairness and they have proofs for their position. So that's one thing. Second thing is what is really not a good thing, is here I am, I've been convinced by some sheikh, I haven't thought of practicalities. I'm still an immature 25-year-old uh, or, you know, 26-year-old. I haven't thought of it. It's just hijra, 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 there, whatever. And that's it. Oh, no, no, we're not, we're not going to contribute there. We're not going to contribute. We're going to start saving there. But what do I do? I now start talking to other people, giving my crass opinion, fractured opinion, with no reality to it. And that's it. The next thing I've got seven or eight old brothers all stuck there in a hijra, hijra. Yeah, I still know brothers who are still doing it trying to do Hijra today, it's been 17, 16, 18 years, and they've not contributed a single thing to society. The place that I've moved into now, um, uh, Redbridge, I used to come to Ilford 
Okay, first of all, I've had cousins in Ilford, so I've been here since the 70s, okay? But as a kind of religious talk, even before the mosque was established, I used to hold circles in the Redbridge area. And the thing that you knew about Redbridge in the, in the late 80s and the 90s, it was more affluential than E11, E, uh, E11, uh, E11 E17, where I grew up, uh, E11, E10, Leighton, Leighton Stone, Walthamstow, okay? You'd actually kind of, once you kind of do well, you move to the IG area, okay? And if you really did well, you moved to that kind of, that Redbridge triangle area. Okay, and then maybe further out after that. And we used to find all these brothers, and there was many, many brothers, okay? Uh, Elias might even know some of them, okay? And yet we found hijra, 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 swept across them, okay? And they didn't establish a mosque, they didn't establish an Islamic center, they got really good, many of them got really good jobs in IT careers, earning from student to 50,000, 40,000, 50, 60,000 pounds at the height of the IT boom and bubble and whatever, but nothing for the dean. Nothing. Couldn't establish even a mosque, which was established years, years later, or an Islamic center, or this, or that. Hijra, 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 hijra. And really, Allah will ask them for every single second of their youth that they had the ability to help the ummah and, and, and the society, and they didn't. What type of believers do we think we are that we can do it, that, uh, that Allah is just going to ignore? No, every deed is going to be accountable for. We should have that sense of shame and fear of God. So my problem is not an individual brother or sister who believes in the Hijra thing, but they tend to believe it in a way that they upset the greater part of society because then they start pushing out this uh, fantasy view. Not a fantasy fiqh view, because it's not a fantasy view, it's a reality view, but a fantasy view as where you're going to go. Otherwise, I've known one or two brothers. I've known a, a brother from Scotland, born and bred in Scotland, so he's, you know, white, you know, his tribe goes back to a Tartan clan, and he made his migration, alhamdulillah, to Pakistan. Uh, married a Pakistani woman, learned Urdu, and, uh, and what, do you, what do they speak in the northwest frontier? Pushtu. Pushtu, he, uh, Pushtu and Urdu. A uh, bit of a problem after 9-11. A lot of a problem after 9-11. <laughs> uh, but anyway, so, um, so in the end, he kind of had to leave there. But he was there for about 12, 13 years. Okay, we made the migration, mashallah. And when his wife was pregnant, he didn't come back to Whips Cross Hospital or St. George's. Khalas. I made migration for the sake of Allah. Mashallah. Did he make a big hue and cry about it? Just saved up and he just went. And just before he held a dinner for most of us, we had to travel to Leeds to, to attend it. Mashallah. Hugs, kisses, cries, whatever. And on his way. Fantastic. May Allah reward him. And may Allah. Uh, reward him whether he's done the right thing or not, but may Allah reward him for his intention for wanting to secure his deen. Simple. So, uh, be, we, uh, fiqh has to be realistic. That if someone's going to make hijrah as a scholar, okay, if you ask Sheikh Haytham Haddad, okay, Sheikh Haytham will say, mashallah, hijrah, da 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 ba. brother, where are you going to go? If you can find a way where you can go, you can establish for your family, and there is a level of justice, and there is a level of citizenship, and the basic rights, and your family and your faith can grow. Bismillah. But where is that going to be? And even if you can find for an individual, you can't be mass announcing this from the pulpit. Oh, by the way, hijra. Um, so bear that in mind, inshallah. Anyway, that's fudaik. All I'm trying to say is, I. there is a view amongst Muslims, and I feel it's a wrong view, whereby they're bending over backwards too much to try to fit into... Modern Britain. I can't tell you exactly who they are because that requires knowing their intentions. But there is, there are writings and attitudes coming out that, you know, we're British Muslims, but really kind of, it's, it's said in a way whereby you can change the Sharia so that you can fit in. And that, I suspect, is uh, it's not only dangerous, it's, 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 it's problematic and it's, it's possibly dangerous. That's not, don't get me wrong, if a person, a scholar, wants to take the path of as much ease in fatwas as possible for the Muslim community, then that's actually very reminiscent of the prophetic teachings, of the Quranic teachings. Okay, we have been sent to make things easy on people, not to make things difficult. Okay, well, you have been sent to make things easy upon people, not to make things difficult. And there's so many things like that. However, the, uh, the idea of ease and difficulty, <coughs> usr and yusr, are very much dependent upon the sharia themselves. 
So it's not you and I and our desires that make things easy or not. There are Sharia standards. And more and more scholars are beginning to realize that Muslim communities in the West, in fact, even in traditional Muslim lands now in the modern age, not worth putting on them the, the, the azimah, the strictest opinion. If there is a genuine rukhsa, which doesn't kind of get into uh, fisk to make you a, 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 a rebel against the Sharia, then maybe the lenient, more lenient opinions should come about, at least for the public, for, but for, my, for our own spiritual growth. Azima is always the best thing. The stricter, the normative opinion. Stricter means the normative opinion. But understand this. The fact that this religion is easy, the fact that you have been sent to make things easy for people <coughs> not to make difficult, should not be understood that, ah, Therefore, I can say to someone, oh, by the way, you only have to pray three times a day. Surely three pray prayers are easier than five. That's not ease. or that comes, That's outside of the fold. Because why there's something clear about what the ease and the moderation is. It's five. Okay. But, um, uh, for example, um, someone might say, well, look, uh, let's just say they held the view just like I'm expressing it. That uh, co contemporary Islamic mortgages... They have a few Sharia problems, but on the whole, they are so much closer to being halal than they are haram. And when we look at it, uh, and we throw in one or two Hanafi kind of f philosophies on top of that, one, you kind of, uh, Islam kind of needs to be dominant kind of thing, so by law you're, you end up having to give interest if, you, you know, if your bank account goes over, but we should never take interest. Well, in the end, you can't let kufr overtake Iman, okay, the Qur'an is kind of clear on that. So in order to balance that out, that under certain circumstances, some of the Hanafi scholars, it's not, uh, might be, might, may not even be a dominant view, but anyway, it's there in the fiqh, that maybe something could be taken. Point is, now you have these Islamic mortgages. So now here I am in my, well, my sheikh has pointed out why, uh, two of my sheikhs have pointed out why actually they don't meet the criteria. In, in, uh, and from what... I've understood they don't meet the criteria, and that's my, but righteous sheikh said they almost meet the criteria and they are far better than not. And then there's a second philosophy that many elder people have worked out, is that how do you become a vibrant community if you don't even possess, own your own possession of a house? You can never be a stable community if you don't have kind of uh, material possessions like houses and, and, uh, and estates, okay? Uh, Islam recognizes so much that's why we have laws on stealing and cheating and all the detailed Sharia laws on, on possession and rights of possession and so on and so forth. So, uh, so maybe in this opinion, it could be for those who take the, the two views that I've expressed, and there are more shades of it, someone could say, well, okay, even though I don't, but for the rukhsa, for the public, don't go and give them the strictest opinion, but individually amongst them, you'll find that people, there are certain people who are very strong in their practice. And what's the philosophy behind it? Look, this, this, these people, most of these people are not establishing five prayers anyway. They're, they want to, but they haven't. Most of these people and women haven't even covered with hijab yet. Many of these people still come into you with their interest-based bank accounts in HSBC and NatWest and whatever, whatever, even though they know they wouldn't like to. And it's weakness of faith, not a rebellion against faith itself, just weakness, sin, sinfulness and weakness of faith. And then you want to just throw on them out of the true opinions, the strongest opinion, you know it's not going to work. They're barely managing the basics. They're barely managing the basics. So here wisdom would dictate that you have to put upon them some fatwa, give them the easier. The easier is within the sharia, the within, or at least within sharia as according to a number of scholars. Because there is the opposite thing. To become a true practicing Muslim, you have to be the harshest and the strictest as possible. Audhu Billah. That is a bid'ah from amongst the bid'ahs, really. And I, I can only assume without thorough investigation that it comes from the Khawarij. That it comes from the Khawarij from Kilab and Nar and the dogs of Elf the Prophet said. Huh. The Prophet Sallallahu he was very... See, when... There is an issue in fiqh, right? Supposing you know a Muslim man, and most of his earnings is haram. 
he's got it from haram me. <coughs> like, let's just say 90% of what he earns, his risk, is haram. And you know that for quite certain. It's kind of known in the community. And then this Muslim, let's call him, let's call him Bilal. This Muslim says to Ilyas, oh, brother Ilyas, come to my house for some chicken and rice. So Ilyas now, he's, you know, he's got a dilemma. Well, Bilal's earnings mostly 90% are haram. So it could be that I could be having a, a meal which is haram. And Ilyas is cautious enough to know that maybe his dua won't be responded with haram food and haram clothing and this. And it makes a big difference. Okay. So then he says, well, so is it permissible for me to eat from Bilal's food or not? Because it could be the 10%, but you know, 90% is likely to be the 90%. So the majority of scholars, Imam At-Tabari, uh, Layth ibn Sa'ad, um, some of the students of Imam Ahmed, you ask them, they say, look, unless you know the food in and of itself, you saw him trade in haram, then he's got 10 pounds, and he goes to the meat shop with that same 10 pounds, and he buys the chicken, and that's the chicken that he puts in the pot to cook for your evening meal, then you know that that meat is haram. If you know that, then it's haram. If you don't know that, then assume you're eating from his 10% halal. Imam Ahmed was asked the very same question. Imam Ahmed bin Hanbal. And he said, you Jews, it's not permissible to eat from such a man's house. Why? Because Imam Ahmed is not giving fatwa. He's talking about taqwa, wara. And if anyone knows the life of Imam Ahmed... And the students who asked him that, Abu Dawood, I think, asked him this, uh, a Sijistan in the Masai. And Abu Dawood was already a person who, you know, forget, you know he's, he's keeping away from haram, he's keeping away from most halal things as well. That's how cautious Abu Dawood is. And so he's asking the master. And of course the master is going to say to the student, he's going to tell him to do the highest thing, the most saintly thing possible. Hey, the Jew is not permissible. Why do you want to take that chance? So we need to make the distinction between Imam Ahmed's taqwa fatwa and the normal Fatwa, which is the letter of the law, says it's halal unless you know specifically it's haram. And for some people, for, for the masses, you give the fatwa. But for the, 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 the deeper seeker of God, for the salik, for the, for the person whose suluk is strong, you try to increase, uh, attach him to the, to the wara, to the, the, to, the, uh, to the taqwa basis. It's the, it's the only way. If there are, you'll find in the time of the Salaf and the Imams, they'll be talking about the stricter, stricter, but there came a time whereby it's just the easier, easier. Our problem is now unqualified people too easy. Uh, making it just ease, as in, like, kind of, you know, anyone can make, and it, the halal is, could become, the haram could become halal. That's the problem. The other problem is. Um, we're doing these things when pressure is upon us to conform to a, a, a liberal order. And at the end of the day, however we define liberalism uh, intellectually, it is, it is pandering to the nafs. Because liberalism says everything is allowed between two consenting adults unless it, there is harm. Then they don't, liberalism doesn't kind of define the harm. So it says a woman who's married to, like, like uh, you know, a, ma a woman is married to this man. And another woman is a man. To, but the, the woman in this marriage likes the man of that marriage. Okay? There's nothing to stop them to, to get together. Okay? Because there's, they've not killed anyone in the process. But actually the question needs to be asked. If you're saying it's allowed between two consenting adults, providing there's no harm, how do you define what's happening to the children in these marriages? Okay, yeah, for sure they're not got beaten up or, or shot in the head. But there is a type of harm that is probably worse than getting shot in some cases. And liberalism doesn't quite have an answer to those kind of things. But nevertheless, it's pandering to the nafs. Um, so we need to be careful of these things. And in our own personal lives, try to stick with the normative ruling of the school so that we can spiritually grow and journey to Allah SWT. Why? Because the Prophet said, every king has a hima. Every king has a... Uh, a, a preserve or a sanctuary and Allah's hima are his prohibitions and in the in the days in this country if you Epping Forest okay which we still have pieces all scattered over even this area and and uh, and E11 and place like that if you shot deer in Epping Forest you could be hanged and killed why because Epping Forest was the was the king's forest it was the king's hima the king of England 
You could go and shoot deer somewhere in, I don't know, some Richmond Park or something like that. Okay, well, you couldn't do that then because that was also royalty. But anyway, let's just, let's just say you could. Right? Um, but you couldn't shoot in the Epping Forest because it was off bounds unless the king said so. Well, this concept of the king having, having special grounds and you can't transgress on it is an ancient concept. And the Prophet uses that metaphor to say, look, Allah's sacred ground are his prohibitions. Don't step into them. And so uh, he gave the example of a shepherd grazing his sheep near the himmah. It's possible that they're outside of the limit, but slowly and steadily they just go into it. And it can happen easily. Slide from the halal into the haram is very easy. And therefore we keep a strong barrier. Uh, Imam al-Hajjawi from the great imams of the Hanbali scholars, he, uh, he mentions this beautiful example, which I think is very useful, um, about faith. He says, imagine... Uh, faith, religion rather, to be like uh, a fortress at the centre. And this fortress, the citadel, is surrounded by five walls, fortified walls. And the enemy, in order to get to that, the, the fortress, where is the, the king and the jewels or whatever is exp worthy, they have to overcome the five walls. Okay? The first wall, he said, Actually, he, he says this, and it goes back to Sheikh Abdul Qadir al-Jilani, who it seems to be, makes this analogy first. The first wall of the fortress is made of, of, of mud. The second is made of bricks. The third inward one is made of iron. The fourth, even closer to the fortress, is made of silver. And the fifth, which is right circling the actual fortress itself, is made of gold. And then there's the fortress. And the enemy has to overcome all these five. He goes, if the, if the, if the, the people of that land are uh, lackadaisical, are loose in guarding the, uh, the, the brick wall and the enemy overcome the brick wall, uh, the, the mud wall, then they could be on a roll for the brick wall. And if they do the brick, then it's possible they could do the iron and the iron and the silver and the silver. They could actually come and ransack the fortress. And so the sensible king will always say, look, even though we have five walls, we'll just put maximum guard on the mud wall so they don't even get past the first wall. Because it's, it's also psychological. If you know that the enemy's got past the first wall, you just think, oh gosh, they could get past the second one. And you're already kind of on a losing psychological feeling. So kind of, no way. They're not going to get past the, even the first wall. And alhamdulillah, the fortress we say. And, and Hajawi says, the first wall of bricks is like Adab, the Muslim beautiful behavior. The second wall uh, of mud is Adab. The brick wall is uh, the faraid, the obligations, the prayer, the fasting. The third wall, inward wall, okay, of iron is the sunan, the sunnas. The fourth wall is iman, faith. The fifth wall is yaqeen, certainty. If the enemy get past our Adab wall, and he wears slack on adab, of, of propriety, of, 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 of the beautiful behaviour, con conduct behaviours in Islam, it's possible it could begin to eat into our faraid. And if our fard, uh, 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 sorry, uh, our sunnans, sorry, our sunnans, and if our sunnans get eaten into, okay, well, I'm doing my fard of maghrib, but kind of like I'm now not doing my sunnans, it's very possible that sooner or later one or two maghrib fards will get missing and whatever. We start eating into the sunnas, it will eat into the fard. Eat into the fard, faith begins to weaken itself. Faith becomes to weaken, you start even doubting the actual th yaqeen of, you know, of, of Allah and the angels and the hereafter. So be strong on the, 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 the mud wall, which is the wall of adab. Which is why uh, the scholars have insisted to me, Abu Ali, you know, obviously in your own life you have to do your best, but also in your teaching life, make sure that as much as possible, remind people of adab. They may think, oh, but, 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 because it's really important. Don't let them, remind them to build the wall and keep it there and protect it. And what happens is in this manhaj of making things easy, Sometimes we could forget that actually that's the nature of the, rea the reality. So I can't give you a solution, and scholars don't, haven't united upon a solution one particular way, but somehow we need to balance between keeping these walls alive and healthy and understanding it's the nature of the masses that you can't impose upon them the strictest or the heaviest or the, 
uh, strong, uh, you know, uh, uh, hardest opinion because they're already not managing with even the basics. And our way should be a way of mercy, just like we wish for your brother, which you wish unto yourself. And it's not for the way of the teacher to just overloading, it's his students. That's not from compassion. And if we're not compassionate, then we're not teaching like the Prophet. However, that is different than making haram halal, just willy nilly and and and. What we do <coughs> need in the books of Asul al Fiqh, uh, Islamic legal theory, when it discusses ijtihad, taqlid, and fatwas, it says, what are the qualities that make it permissible to take fatwa from a, a, a particular scholar? They say he needs to be alim bi sharia. Someone who you take fatwas from needs to be alim bi sharia, uh, knowledgeable of, 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 of sharia. And that's kind of generally well known. They say he needs to be uh, amilun. He needs to somehow roughly act upon his knowledge. His knowledge might be a bit higher than his acting, but his acting needs to be somewhere. His action, you know, he can't be someone who's not even praying or fasting or whatever. I mean, that's just, just unacceptable. So he needs to be amilun. And he needs to be much more amilun than others. But thirdly, they say, the third condition, shart, from the shurud, is that he has to have wara. Not that he just has taqwa, because taqwa is more so, taqwa, God fear and his piety, is more related to obligations and prohibitions. He needs to have wara, which is higher, related to things which are makru and sunnas. He's, he keeps more away from the makrus and he's more involved in the sunnas than not. Okay, and even higher than that. And so we need people who are, who are, anim uh, bi aminun, and they have wara. And then they have an understanding of, by the time they give us this ruling, what psychological impact does it have on the Muslim community? Because today, a lot of psychology is involved in just day-to-day -day living, and you can't avoid it. In a way that, it, it was there before, but it wasn't so kind of, it wasn't so kind of uh, systemized and, and made clear. You can't be a doctor, you can't be even a dentist, you can't even be a football manager. You can't even, you know, you can't even work in, in, in Tesco's or like, like, a, like a CEO of Tesco's without knowing some deep psychology. The mental, and, and, and neuroscience helps us and human history has helped us. So uh, things like that really need to help. Otherwise, it, otherwise we're just going to end up in this mess. For ourselves, let's stick with the azima, the strict opinion. Why? Because... We don't want to graze in Allah's himma. And the Prophet says in that same hadith, whoever say, keeps himself away from that himma has protected his religion and his honor. So, Prophet is clear. It's a bit like, you know, those simple hadiths that we know, but we tend not to add, add calm. Prophet says, don't get angry, la taqdab. And then in one hadith, he says, like, you know, if you get angry, what's the sunnah? Sit down. Yeah, sit down. And if that doesn't do the trick, lie. yeah, lie down. Sunnah, it's so clear. It's not in one hadith or two. There's so many hadiths that are do wadu as well. Even the most practicing people, we would never sit down or lie down. In fact, we're telling people, go, you're angry, go and demonstrate. The Sunnah is saying, yes, you have a right to be angry for the sake of Allah, but not for the sake of your nafs. The anger, the ghadab needs to come from the ruh, not the nafs. Okay, and then the anger needs to be. I mean, you look at Ibn Rajab, okay, and his commentary to the La Dahdab. He'll tell you the Salaf said, being angry for the sake of Allah is one of the hardest things in the world to do. And yet we have about 200 million of us who all believe that we're angry for the sake of Allah. MashaAllah. The Salaf, who feared, uh, uh, I'm not quite sure if I'm angry for the sake of Allah, but somehow we manage in our, in our poor piety. And probably mostly, a lot of it is, it's, if it's not hypocrisy, it's lot, a lot of it is dirt and gunge in our souls. But somehow we're, you know, we're angry for the sake of Allah, but the Salaf were kind of a bit cautious. And they said it's one of the hardest things. Why? Because you have to, the, first of all, the, the, the object of anger has to be lawful or, or sharia prescribed. You can't be angry there, and Allah says, no, you, it doesn't allow it. And... You should have been angry there. That's one thing. So you have to determine that. And then secondly, proportion. Anger in proportion. And that the soul, the nafs, shouldn't have a, 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 a share of it. Or a, a, certainly not a serious share of it. SubhanAllah. It's really difficult. And you know, um, 
Someone wrote a comment on my blog, on one of my pieces. It's called. Uh, it's it about weaning yourself from dunya. And I just remember that was yesterday. I came home from a, a, a busy seminar. I was kind of tired and everything like that. And, and then I just read this comment. And I thought oh, the brother hasn't understood it. Uh, he was saying, "Oh, you know, yes, this is this the author of this article. Uh, this is one way of weaning yourself from dunya. But we actually don't have to run away from the dunya. Islam doesn't require us to run away from the dunya." And I thought, but I wasn't saying that, and I've kind of never held that view: run away from the dunya. And you know, I re and, I, and I was thinking, but didn't I quote Ibn Taymiyyah and the verse of the Quran of "Keep your portion of the world"? And Rabban Atin and Fitna and Ibn Taymiyyah said that you should view wealth like, rather like you view the toilet, in that you need it and you resort to it when necessary, but it has no place in your heart. So how did he kind of get to this conclusion? So I wrote, I, I began to write, and I realized, you know, I'm agitated. I'm agitated, and actually, at this time, it was round about this time last night is I'm not agitated for the sake of Allah that, oh, he's kind of misunderstood the deen of Allah. He's misunderstood me. Me. Okay. So I stopped writing and I just kind of left it. Uh, and I thought, no, if I write now, even if I write this, whatever I write, it probably will be Islamically correct, but it's the agitation of me. So I waited until the morning and I wrote more or less exactly what I was going to write. But now it was a case of, mashallah, you know, this brother probably really well, it means really well and this and the other. And you know what, if you look at it, you could, oh, any writing is misunderstandable. And he could have had a, a bad day like I did and, and da da da. So I wrote to him what I, exactly what I was going to write, but I felt that it was not from me. Okay. Um, and one just has to be honest with themselves. Just khalas. And there are things like that. And if I know that that's the, and that's just a small thing. I mean, he wasn't even denying the concept of zuhud. He just thought that, you know, that that's not really how you should express it. And truth be told, he could be right. I'm, I think he's less likely right and I'm more likely right. But he could be right. Okay. Um, and yet, somehow I'm thinking that on the deeper issues, I'm going to, my, my anger is going to be purely for the sake of Allah. Demonstrations, you know, you've heard from me before. It's, I, I, I don't believe they're bid'ah in the sense, even though that I, I know that the Salaf didn't do it, and it's a, a type of political protest that does get exported from European styles of, of protest and whatever. Nevertheless, that doesn't in, instantly make it haram necessarily. But it's like, you know, it's just like the, the, the norm is we, we don't tend to protest non violently or non horribly. We we'll always have. I mean, it doesn't mean that there aren't nice people protesting, but we always have to have the, 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 the you know, the banner brigade, you know, uh, cut this head off. It's a bit like, you know, did the Sahaba march through the streets of Makkah, behead Abu Talib, okay, uh, hang Abu Jahl, you know. It's, no, they didn't. It's just, it's subhanAllah. But we, we're going to have that. So that's kind of very uh, problematic. Anyway, the, the, the point of all of this is, Somewhere. Sorry, uh, you didn't mean to say Abu Talib. Abu, uh, uh, sorry, Abu sorry, Barakallah. Not Abu Lahab, Barakallah. Abu Lahab and Abu Jahl. Fikum. Abu Lahab and Abu Jahl. Behead Abu Lahab. We didn't have the Sahabas. Because it's not really, you know, that's not really a dean thing to, to do. Guide Abu Lahab and whatever. And then if the harm comes and find positive ways to stop him and eliminate. You don't kind of... So all, all I'm saying is anger has to be for the sake of Allah. It just let's just have honesty, honesty. That really, uh, I have a lot. My my nafs, my inward is really dirty. It's in need of serious improvement. Sincerity is, at best, precarious. And that has to be the case because the great salaf before us they feared for these things. Okay, and at least if we don't have that deep introspection, we should just know, well, look, if they feared for these things, it's got to be worse for me. It's got to be worse for me. Because they were the people of piety and taqwa. Anyway, so um, those were a few things. I, I did want to say one more thing, but maybe we can do it for another time because it's kind of gone well over the time. So in this country, we just need to get on with our deen. Uh, we're probably going to get... The worst is yet to come. Economic downturns will play a big role. Uh, what we Muslims do and don't do will play a big role. Europe's 
ancient history and attitudes will play a big role. All it needs is one event to play its big role. So it's going to be difficult. How difficult? Well, but difficult enough that we might not be here. Or difficult enough that, mashallah, we'll be here, established, and we'll be changing the world. We should have an optimism, though. We should be optimistic. Because if Allah Jalla wa ala, didn't allow the armies of Tawheed and Iman to come in with their flags and their horses and their swords, and they were stopped at the Pyrenees, okay, a uh, hundred years after the Prophet sure. and then all of a sudden we have en masse people of Iman and Islam come in throughout Europe, part of the very fabric of Europe, second, third, even fourth generation Muslims in certain European countries and cities, then Allah has put us here for a purpose. That purpose is not to get angry and enraged. It is to somehow, in my own life, work from my ruh, my higher soul, and not from my nafs, and share that beauty and mercy with others. So that it's not the case of, oh, angel of the mountains, crush these people. But I hope that from these people will come some people who will worship Allah alone and not commit any shirk with him. And Just Allah to Allah mention Allah on the anger and proportion. Uh, when you mentioned Palestine and the aggression in Gaza, the disproportionate response, response Absolutely. caused... Absolutely. a proportionate anger among Muslims, even though whether there are non-Palestinians, non-Arabs, I'm talking about Muslims, Ummah. So the response sometimes, in whatever form or shape it takes, whether it's a demonstration or what, is on the basis of the disproportionate use of force, which when you see is unjust, and nobody has uh, spoken against it when you see the super international stand, yeah exactly. international oh, and course. when you see that it boils makes your blood boil whether you are uh, a british muslim or somewhere in indonesia or wherever you are so that disproportionate anger will come in it's the result in some form of reaction you're right whether it's a demonstration a peaceful demonstration or whatever but whilst we're but dealing we with those situations... we have also got to be careful that there are institutions which may use that in a negative form mm. and use Muslims to create a fitna within our society. Possibly. You're right. <coughs> it, it can always happen. It's politics. So we sure. have to be very careful. No, you're right. May Allah, Allah... And this is really just a reminder that, you know, uh, uh, unless we're unless we're clear that we by ourselves won't really be able to change this. We need divine intervention. We need the help of Allah. And then we need to have all the asbab, all the worldly means to connect to the help of Allah. And the fact that we haven't got it as Allah has promised that he would give to the believers, it means that there is a deficiency amongst us somewhere. And we need to start patching up those things. And part of that is we need to be acting from the higher reaches of our soul. Okay, we're not talking about praying a thousand rakahs of nafil. We're just talking about just introspection and beginning to do things not so much for the nafs or for the for that uh, for the for the ghadab of the lower self, but for the pure ghadab of Allah, which is very different. Because sometimes, many times, the Prophet expressed his anger without that those physiological changes or very few physiological changes. because the ghadab of Allah doesn't mean frothing at the mouth in fact it seldom means frothing at the mouth in fact it probably does never mean frothing at the mouth but there is a ghadab for the anger which is that uh, that justice demands that the heart not be happy with this state I mean, we have two I mean, I come, come to my mind these two examples from Rasulullah and those two battles Uhud few people made a mistake Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala didn't help the Prophet. They could have been victorious, so no. for example. Hunayn, I mean, even more. Who did the mistake? Very few people. Very few people thought of, now we are in huge numbers. We have got all the armaments. We can fight them off very easily. Yet Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Why? On the day of Hunayn, you, exactly. you, you, were, you, you, were, you were over amazed or were in so, vain with your numbers. So, so the wrong action can never be justified. Whatever are the reasons, yes, we can work out and try to, to improve them, try to somehow tackle them, 
we can we can not say since there has been injustices on the other side we are justified to be unjust just injustice or wrong things would remain there could be a reason to understand it's easy and i know you are telling us in order to we for for us to understand the reasons why why it could have happened we can we all perceive that and understand inshallah ta'ala but it would never make it right to inshallah ta'ala I, i hope you you know i mean you're not denying that clearly i'm yeah. just making okay. it clear. will the anger be less if the aggressor has to be having to be a muslim group for example the israel if they are a muslim country bombing that will the anger be less who knows will be the same who knows or you, you can should, you can change it slightly okay. it if it was iran not iran palestine and, iran and yeah. Uh, yeah. iraq that's exactly what i'm yeah. saying yeah. if iraq it was not been, yes. palestine yes. it was some other country yes would the anger be the same I and if the unjust injustice by the perpetrators be the same or the same disproportionate level would we show or do we show same level of anger and rage and frustration and demonstration or is it just Palestine has got slightly more you know, uh, you know I mean uh, my 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 problem is from a long time ago uh, is if we were talking about just human li- lives or lives of believers muslims then in my conscious time as a youth up until now okay more people have, more muslims have died by a ratio of 1 to probably 1000 or 10000 in in uh, in africa especially central africa than they have ever died in palestine and yet i find that there's very few tears it's a different type of death but these are economic reasons but it's still mothers and children and actually sometimes their death is far more acute because they go through weeks and weeks of near death whereas and i i don't mean to be crass but whereas you get blown up by a bomb instantaneously okay and for one person that goes that gets blown up by a bomb for whatever reason a muslim palestinian let's say there are probably uh 3 to 4000 people of uh, mothers and children who are going through dire hunger because uh the capitalist predominantly western economies have made economics <coughs> such that the nature of the the capitalist world is that you're going to have this huge level of poverty and it's only alleviated by the charity of others not through the economic process itself and yet the muslims have very little to say about that so and and i have no doubt in my mind my aqeedah tells me the blood of a palestinian is not worth any more or any less than the blood of a muslim in central africa and so if we're talking about numbers and if we're talking about un- injustice the injustice is put being perpetrated there is far greater and nor am i swayed by the argument about the holy land because though allah puts baraka in certain places lands and objects and people but beyond land the life of a muslim is more holy than any holy land the life of a muslim is more sacred than the kaaba itself well i mean it is in that <clears throat> this is a kind of association allah created us in unity and groups so that we can recognize each other so maybe the muslim the majority of muslim they cannot associate themselves with the people in uh, in, in in central africa we are talking about why can't they i don't know why because well, they, they're, they're not muslim enough they, they are muslim, had a, they are muslim enough because it's um it's identification isn't it well you know if i th- when i think of africa not so much central africa if i think of africa yes. okay i think of that west african scholar and if you include egypt but no leave in egypt if you include just i think of that great west african scholarship tradition mm-hmm. that produced major beauty major scholarliness and whatever in a way that if i think of palestine of the last 4 500 years i i mean of course i can think of nablus and ramallah and some of the scholars that come from there and whatever but subhanallah uh there is no reason for an educated muslim to feel any less uh, identified with uh a uh, uh, black muslim africa than uh bronze muslim palestine okay uh, but it it is the holy land and the third holy masjid is there and 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 uh so it there isn't i'm not saying it's not special for any distinct reasons i'm just saying justice wise dr salim is making the point that is our heart beating for justice or for tribalism i thought 
if, right, if it's justice, then the same injustice done from someone to anyone should make the heart beat in the same uh, angry way. But since our hearts don't beat in the same angry way there, there and there, it seems like that it's a, a, a slightly twisted sense of justice. And you know what? You could be kicked out mosques, you could be called a hypocrite, you could be called a Mossad agent for even voicing sensible Islamic things like this. Because there are a growing number of people whose voices are becoming dominant within Muslim communities across the world who have twisted, warped, kharijite understandings of faith and in an age in which the scholars are diminishing in their number and ignorance is increasing, secular worldly knowledge is in, uh, 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 ignorance is increasing and religious knowledge is decreasing as the Hadith of Prophet. One of the signs of the Day of Judgment is that knowledge would decrease and ignorance would increase. But according to right now, you'd think knowledge is increasing because my children, they know more about facts and figures given the World Wide Web, okay, and given the net than, than, kind of, you know, than I ever did kind of thing. Uh, but that's not religious, spiritual knowledge, knowledge of Deen, of Allah. That's decreasing. So in the in the absence of true scholars, all it is is a lot, a lot of self-made scholars. And it's a challenge even for the likes of me. Sometimes you feel, oh, hold on. but then you think, hold on a minute. <coughs> Always go back to scholarship. Always go back to proper scholarship. So all I'm saying is Palestine has to be done. They, <coughs> subhanAllah, uh, when, when our country, <coughs> whose hands are the most bloodstained in this particular affair of Palestine, SubhanAllah, you'd think, okay, if you had to give, give in to the Zionist quest for a Jewish national homeland and there are historical reasons why they identify with Judea, with, with Palestine, that's understandable. You had to give it in that proportion, tingy bit there and a lot there, and then you didn't, didn't even think about what would happen if you're uprooting you know, 10 generations of Palestinians from their homes and from their, from their orange groves and from their olive groves and, what, and you're not going to compensate for them? You didn't think about that? What you wanted, oh, oh Britain, is that get the Jewish problem off of our back because we feel guilty of oppressing Jews and turning a blind eye. And well, they're just Arabs. As the number one Brit said, Winston Churchill, and I'm quoting Arunditi Roy, who is then quoting John Pilger, who is then quoting Noam Chomsky, okay? So I've checked two sources, and I didn't check the Noam Chomsky source because I, I haven't got the book. Who says that Churchill said, I don't believe that the dog <coughs> has any more right to the manger, manger, that's the place where a baby will sleep, like a cradle, just because it slept in it. <coughs> and the dog being the Palestinians, okay? Uh, the man was a racist. I mean, a brilliant, uh, a brilliant galvanizer of national spirit, and uh, 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 gutsy enough to, to even if America didn't join the war, we're still going to take on the Third Reich and, and Nazi Germany. But a racist nonetheless. <laughs> They just put a statue in Jerusalem somewhere. Actually. Subhanallah, and here is yeah, yeah, but I, I, is it? It's not the Palestinians who have done that, no. Uh, <laughs> well, there you are, yeah, because it's 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 someone calling the Palestinians, and you know that includes Christian Palestinians. But Palestinians are dogs, the 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 the, the, the sleeping dogs in the manger. Yeah, well, there you have it. I have a question. But he gives good. He gave good speeches. <laughs> On the beaches. On the beaches, absolutely. <laughs> we will find them <coughs> on the beaches. Um, I'd like to go back actually um, to the bit where you said about the. Let, let's leave aside the self appointed scholars who, who are not scholars, you know, giving factors. Let's leave them aside. The point about making um, it slightly easier rather than taking the, 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 the difficult bit. Mm -hmm. Is it not a slippery slope? Because as soon as you start sort of thinking, then, then, then the next bit's. Yes. You know, it's a slippery slope. So, yes. should the scholars not turn and say, look, if it comes to usury, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has forbidden it. Yes. Let's, let's not just, you know, start making excuses. No, let's not start getting halal mortgages and this mortgage and that mortgage. No, it's haram. If you're involved, do toba. Repent. Ask Allah, please, Allah, get me out of this. I'm in a problem. Rather than trying to dumb it down and trying to justify it. Uh, yes. Similarly for alcohol. No. Yeah. 
whether you drink alcohol, whether you sell alcohol, whether you serve alcohol, it's haram. If you're doing your restaurant down the road and you are selling alcohol, I'm sorry, it's still haram. I can't make it halal for you. What I would suggest that you do is please try very hard, first repent to do Tawbah to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and ask him, beg him to get you away from give you some other rizq in halal uh, for. Okay, uh, uh, please give me the opportunity here for something which I was meaning to do for a long time. Even though, uh, and you know my personal opinion and, uh, about um, current day um, Islamic mortgages, um, I don't actually think they're Islamic. I don't have a problem with the scholars who do think they are, but I don't think they are. But uh, we need to see how, we need to see broadly how the scholars arrived at it. And I'd just like to give you an example, though it's not exactly the example, but I, I, I do believe it could help to uh, under, um, help understand, appreciate where some of these scholars are coming from, okay? Uh, uh, so, for example, um, forget about what it's called, but I'm in need of a thousand pounds. So I go to a brother, a Muslim brother, and I say, can I borrow a thousand pounds for a, uh, for a year? He goes, yeah, but by the end of the year, I, I'd like 1,200 pounds back. Yeah, but brother, that's uh, riba, that's usury. Can't do that. He goes, yeah, oh. But he's so greedy for getting money. He goes, no problem. He goes, Abu Ali, I've got a laptop. I've got a laptop. I'll sell it to you for 1,200 pounds for deferred payment for a year. And you have to buy it. Okay, so I buy it. So I said, okay. I take possession of the laptop. I now owe him one thousand two hundred pounds. Then he says, okay, I'll buy that laptop back from you for a thousand pounds. So I give him the laptop back, and I a thousand pounds cash on hand. So at the end of those two transactions, I got a thousand pounds, which is what I wanted in the first place. And I owe him how much in a year's time? One thousand two hundred. One thousand two hundred pounds. I owe him one thousand two hundred pounds, which is what he wanted in the beginning of the deal. If you take those individual things, they're both of those individual transactions are halal. Buyback transaction. Uh, both of them are halal, in and of themselves. What makes it haram is the intention. And that how it all happened all in one quick go. And you could see that what the out, why the outcome should be is because Brother X just wanted £1,200 extra back for loaning £1,000 for a year. But, but it's also possible, and that's why the Hanbalis, as far as I know, the Hanafis and the Malikis make this type of transaction called Ina absolutely haram. But a group of the Shafis say that it does depend upon your intention. And there could be a, a, a way of un, unintendedly, unintentionally transacting like that and you don't intend to violate the command of God. Point being is, sometimes you can get two or three transactions in and of themselves, that was the point I was trying to make, where they are halal. But by the time you put them together in a little project, they end up being haram. Many scholars have said that's exactly the nature of Islamic mortgage. That if you look at the nine or ten transactions that are happening individually in isolation, all of them are above board. But by the time they come to you in the package called Islamic finance, then there is a problem like in that example I gave. So it's not so clear. It's not so black and white. Okay, It's more tending to problematic than it is. But... The scholars haven't just, oh, let's make riba halal. They're saying that actually this is more or less riba free with one or two little holes which we're improving day by day. But it's certainly not clear cut riba. That's one thing. Second thing I want to, uh, an example that I want to make in, Isla in Islamic law is this. Here I am a thousand years ago and I'm working in a, uh, I'm working for you as a business. Now I'm working for someone as a business, it's beyond my control. And there's some haram in the business, which the modern equivalent could be, I'm working in Tesco's and I'm stacking shelves, but I'm also stacking wine and pork uh, and a few other things that it's just haram for me to do. But in the end, I've either got that job or I've got no job. Now I could take the higher level for my own personal self, say, well, I'll just not have this job. But the scholars answer this question a thousand years ago. Suppose you have a job of that nature and uh, for some reason, at the moment, you can't leave it and get an alternative pure halal job. What do you... Is your income that you get at the end of the month haram? And they say, well, look, the ideal is 
that if you can get another job, which is 100% halal, then that's the obligation upon you. And then some scholars will say uh, to individuals that why don't you leave it trusting Allah and he'll give you a halal job. Other scholars say stick with the job until you get a halal job, but you should be seriously looking. And they say in the meanwhile, what you do is that, well, I've probably stacked uh, out, of the, uh, out of the 200 pounds a, a, a week that I get, okay, I probably 30 pounds of that is equivalent to stacking pork and, and wine and beer on the shelf or in the fridge. So I give 30 pounds of that away, not in charity, because it's haram money. I give it to a charity, but not as sadaqa on my behalf. And that will purify my wealth. And that is not a present day fatwa, it's a fatwa that goes back a thousand years. So you can get into a situation where the jurists understand that sometimes the world is that it's a mixture of goods and bads. And sometimes you have a type of bad that is so intrinsic and it's very hard to remove. And so for the public, it's allowed, uh, there's a letter of the two evils, uh, with the kind of thing of get purer and purer. That same philosophy has also been used in Islamic mortgages. So I, full, I, I, not fully, I roughly appreciate the scholarship that has gone into this, finally, after about five or six years, okay? But I still don't agree with it, according to the scholars that I follow. I don't want any one of us to think that what is happening here with those such scholars, especially if they're known for their piety and their religiousness and their strictness, Okay, and one or two of them are so kind of pious and strict, okay, that under normal circumstances, they themselves probably wouldn't take it, and they themselves wouldn't even eat the meat in half of the country, in the, half of the Muslims in the country. That's how strict they would be. But I don't want us to think that some of our scholars are like uh, the, uh, the, 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 uh, the, the Yahud, the, 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 the ulama of Bani, Banu Israel, that they're just making halal and haram willy-nilly. They're working within a juristic framework if they're qualified scholars, but according to other scholars, they're not, they're blundering. And you might be think, you might need to think not, for, so you and I can think, the difference between Bukhari and, and Imam Ahmed was in the end, Bukhari, both great scholars of hadith, about, let's just say they're, they're equivalent, okay, so not to differentiate between them. Bukhari was never a scholar for the, for the, for the jama'ah of the Muslim masses. Bukhari was never a scholar for the people. He was a scholar. He never had a people's role. The average person didn't come up for him for fatwa. Imam Ahmed, especially after the mihna, the trial, over 100,000 people, tens of thousands of people, every word of his, they was, they, people would be with a pen ready to write. So his fatwas, he had to think 100 times more than the likes of Bukhari in giving fatwas because his would have a social impact. So when we're in a position of being a, a, a scholar whose fatwas have a huge social impact and it will make or break <coughs> Muslim communities, they have added factors to go for. So I, I don't want to dismiss that because I, it wouldn't be fair for me to say that this is my opinion and we've said that if it's a valid difference of opinion, we'll try to go with it unless it's a very marginal shard opinion. Uh, but this is, inshallah, a valid opinion. It's just that the speaker here uh, consistently doesn't feel to be so and and feels that actually one could still rent okay nevertheless i however they've arrived at it we need to know that these people are righteous uh in their intention in you know in, in doing this and it's not just like that we have to appreciate that why because it's part of I, i'll tell you what um there are two <laughs> there are two crimes in islam for which you allah wages war one is riba but there's one that is worse than that, we tend to forget. Man Whoever shows enmity to a wali of mine, I declare war on him. And the ulama say, Allah's war that he declares against those who despise or hate or mock his awliya, his walis, is worse than his war against those who deal in riba. And Imam Shafi said, if the ulama are not the awliya of Allah, then Allah has no awliya, Allah has no wali. So we need to make, if they are from the true righteous scholars, whose life has been proven. For example, Sheikh Ramadan Bouti, Syria, hasn't said a word, but his whole life is a life of righteousness, piety, and God-fearingness. Now, in, his end, uh, in these, uh, this year or two, where he's not said a word, and in fact, he said some words to actually end up propping up the uh, tyrannical government, uh, uh, being misused against the masses, 
Even the righteous Syrian scholars who've learned from him don't criticize his intentions or his godliness. They just say that at this stage of his life and this stage of the situation, he is unable to see the clarity beyond the, uh, beyond the briefing he's getting from government. But to doubt his piety and his commitment to Islam when he's 60, 70 odd years of severe commitment and jihad, it doesn't get wiped away in, a, in, a, in one single blunder. And that could be the same case for Sheikh Abdullah bin, bin Baz, the former Mufti of the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia. A man who, okay, would live as a pauper even though he had a government salary, would weep when he would hear that people, a woman is, uh, uh, you know, um, uh, is bringing up a single child, who would go out his way to be in debt at the end of every month because of giving charity, who, until the government gave him a better room, he would be sleeping on the bare floor, okay, and that was happy, he was happy with that. And then he makes a few government a, a fatwas, like the Gulf War fatwa, which many people didn't agree with, some did, some didn't. So the minimum we could say is that not to doubt his piety or his knowledge or his commitment to Islam, okay, but maybe he got to a stage whereby he couldn't see beyond the government briefing. That's assuming that his fatwa was wrong. That way, we're not at war with the awliya of Allah. We just agree that they're a human being and they can make mistakes. Otherwise, it's better to take interest from Barclays Bank than to suspect righteous scholars. Both are bad. <laughs> I'm just saying, if you had a choice, I'd, you'd rather take the interest. Because you take the interest, you're warden with Allah. You knock the scholar, all it takes is one more person. Dr. Salim then accepts my criticism of the scholar. It poisons his heart. And da -da. But Dr. Salim not necessarily is going to take the interest like I am, because he might not even need it. But he might be convinced by my criticism of the scholar. So that scholarly criticism against Allah's awliya has more of a devastating effect socially than an in individual person taking rip. That's why they say one is worse than the other. But both are declared war. war. So I do appreciate that. And uh, our scholars need to manoeuvre between firmness and istikhama and having the prophetic mercy and the wisdom to see that this will lead to an overbearing thing on, on, on we, the children, as the community, and being strong here, <coughs> will, uh, being too loose here, will make it too wishy-washy. Too wishy-washy, but too strict. What will happen is you stretch something towards its breaking point, which is what is happening when you over overbear someone, and after a little while, the rubber band just snaps. And a lot of people are snapping. A lot of people are snapping, inshallah. So we'll leave it to those wiser than us, those more God-fearing than us. But there's no harm that we can share in some advice or some worry. Ya Sheikh, don't you think this will happen? And then they'll turn around and say, yes, actually, we thought of that, you know, 20 of us, 30 years ago, and da 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 Oh, jazakallah khair. But Allah has still in this, put in this ummah people of wisdom and an immense scholarship and his awliya, we are not devoid of that jama'ah. They'll never cease to be a group of my ummah, victorious from the truth, and they are from the ulama, awwal, and first and foremost, and they're from other groups later. The sad thing for us, um, Brother Budi, and the sad thing for the majority of us laymen, we, we don't know these people. Yeah, but we have to have a level of confidence that however, whatever because is happening... How do we know that he's not a scholar of the terms that I you, you, yeah. you hear about? Is he a scholar for a dollar? Or is he a, we yeah. don't know the difference between, you know, any of them. Yeah, Your but knowledge, it, you're right. uh, mashallah, you know, but the average layman that I'm talking about, you know, he, he, he doesn't know. He says, it's well, true. you know, this guy says this, but apparently this guy says that. It's true. And, you know. Inshallah, a, a question that needs to be dealt with for another time, another place, inshallah. no doubt, no doubt. But inshallah, inshallah ta we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that he protect our ulama, that he give them greater wisdom, that he give them greater god fearingness that he protect them from our times, and from the uh, machinations of those who wish to see the light of Allah extinguished. Because the light of Allah, actually the candle bearers, the torch bearers are the ulama. Okay, if they get extinguished, really the light is extinguished. And um, we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he gives us a type of confidence in finding righteous scholars who exemplify sunnah and jama'ah. And in the meantime, whatever is simple and straightforward that we can understand, riba is haram, pork is haram, drinking is haram, the, we just keep away from it, inshallah. Whatever fatwa, whatever fatwa we hear, the only thing is we don't make a judgment on something that we might not fully, fully uh, understand. That's all I'm saying. I'm not encouraging Islamic uh, mortgages or, 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 or finance, but I'm just saying that, uh, inshallah ta'ala, those scholars, righteous scholars who have said so, uh, from the scholars that I follow, they'll get one reward.
Okay, and they're still scholars who can be accessed for so many other things in Ta'ala. And even if I get too, re- even if I were to be too rewarded right for Fonat, I'd never be like those scholars in worship or knowledge or anything. Just have to just have to know the reality of who we are in Ta'ala. And uh, we have to have confidence that Allah is a merciful Lord. He's taken this ummah to this time when all other ummahs and religions have just caved in. Okay, and we seem to be just awakening up. Allah has in store for this ummah something immeasurable, and we need to have confidence and hope that that is unfolding. But it requires us to move from our nafs to our rule. Okay, and it will happen in even more quicker. And Allah Jalla wa Ala knows best. We are an ummah of hope because we associate with Allah first and foremost with. I have imposed, enjoined upon myself mercy, Allah says in the Quran. And He sent to us, We didn't send you except as a mercy of the world, the prophet of mercy. Therefore, it's all hope, it's all mercy, it's all graces from heaven. It just means that I, as an individual, move from the nafs to the ru, from the lowest to the lower bestial level to the level of beauty of nafs al mutma'inna. That is the challenge, and everything unfolds. Which is Akal Khayyam, Subhanahu wa Ta'ala, Rabbi Karabil, Izzat, Ya'ma, Yaswan. Yeah.